This week on Today in Space. We start with copper, then we go to selenium, then we go to indium, and then we go to gallium, and then we put it on a poly polyamine back, backing. Mm. That's what creates the flexibility in that, and that's mm. what nobody else has really decided. I think it was yesterday, European Space a Group basically said their goal, I think it was 35 or 2040, no space debris. The FCC laid out their first fine to a company yes. three months ago for space debris. $150,000? Yes, 150,000 bucks. Which is small compared to the uh, what I was reading, the revenue that that satellite gave the company. But regardless, yeah. that's like a big changing eras that's a big step for the fcc to do right. that Welcome, everybody, to Today in Space. We're back for another episode of People of Science, where we get to talk to the people actually behind the world of STEM. And uh, this week, we have a really cool talk with the CEO of Ascent Solar, uh, Paul Warley. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the technology that they have uh, behind their solar technology and what that means for solar debris and really just this age of you know, constellation satellites that we live in where every day more and more satellites go into space and into orbit. So really understanding what happens to these things throughout their lifetime is super important. So Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. I uh, love to talk to you about this. I'm not the greatest science guy. Hey, but, that's okay. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, but I've had a lot of a uh, lot of years in solar and alternative energy. But that's good. I think your perspective is going to be really important. You know, I'm I'm happy to take some of the technical stuff uh, on my end. But honestly, let's just talk about your experience. Let's talk about uh, where you came from and kind of your journey that brought you here. Okay. Um, I started my career in banking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, commercial corporate banking. Uh, then I had a stint for a little over a year with a small boutique investment bank and was able to uh, put together the first landfill gas recovery unit, which basically helped form waste management's $5 billion business today. Oh, wow. Yeah. They were, they were one of the investors in it <laughs> and, wow. uh, did, they did that. That was in the early nineties. Mm. And uh, um, it was an experience. It was an experiment because the first round, the uh, the the carbonic acid ate the machine up in two months. So we had to go redesign it and start it over. <laughs> and so they had to put more. I had to raise more equity and and, and uh, waste management and put more equity in it. But anyway, oh, so that was my that was kind of my first start um, with alternative energy. Then um, at GE, when I was with them, um, we had a we had some clients, GE and uh, um, the German company. We they they really started on energy efficiency early. They were kind of the leaders in the pack, and so we I put together a financial package financing for uh, um, all. Um, energy efficiency projects. Mm. And so early on, you know, we did that for three of my clients and you did a separate financing package and then you split the savings after the financing. And mm. so we put the, put those together and uh, it was Siemens was the other group doing oh, it. Yeah. But then it kind of, it was took off and then it slowed down. And so both people kind of got out of the, I wouldn't say got out of the business, but didn't emphasize it nearly as much. So then I went to work for Deloitte and I went to work for their investment bank, but then it was, it was in their uh, um, alternative energy group and regular oil and gas energy group. When I was on the uh, um, uh, senior executive panel, I guess what it is where we, 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 um, we we would speak at different events worldwide 
about alt energy and efficiencies and, and everything else. So that's where I really got my um, feed into it. Mm. It's fascinating. I love to learn like how, now I would assume that you're passionate about this. It seems like alternate alternative energy is kind of where you've uh, followed uh, the path. Was that something that when you were, you know, going to school for, for finance and stuff, was that your path or did you just find it along the way? stumbled into it I yeah guess that's, that's it <laughs> yeah okay. like most of us yeah. <laughs> yeah so i got to deloitte and like the third week um i get we got i got an email from one of the senior people and said hey we got a investment banking deal it was an oil and gas deal but do, do you have any experience in oil and gas and i was the only one that sent an email back and said well i invested in some oil and gas wells and they said you're it you're the expert yeah that, yeah <laughs> that got me in there and then they learned about my experience in, in the past and they said that they put me on that so i you know i raised capital for solar projects sold solar projects mm. are you familiar with the usgbc which does lead in buildings um, I sold their conference and got involved with a lot of consulting with them. So from that standpoint, that that's kind of how I made my way into the industry. Cool. Cool. Um, where'd you go to school? I went to the Citadel. Mm. Tell me about it. I don't think I've ever heard of it. Um, it's a, it's, have you heard of VMI? No, I don't. Well, think you so. have the you can't Texas A and M. Oh yes, okay, <laughs> okay. yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, the Texas A and M has the military side, so you have the three: uh, you, the Texas A and M, the Citadel, and BMI are, are uh, um, military schools. Uh, okay, and you have a choice of going in the service or not. I actually ended up with a reserve scholarship, so I went into the reserves for eight years. Oh wow, what I was that experience like? Um, it was. It was a, a neat experience. Um, you know, the Citadel, I was part you know, in Army ROTC for four years. That was mm -hmm. one thing you had to take ROTC. So whether you chose not to go in the service or not, and when I was there, it was like 50-50. Mm. So. Yeah, I I, uh, I went to school at uh, Worcester Polytech, and I had a I was in a fraternity, and I had a few uh, fraternity brothers who were in ROTC. So uh, okay, yeah, so I, I know the grind that you guys uh, went through, you know, compared to the guys that were not in it. So yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's cool. That's cool. Um, so so what then brought you from um, you know, alternative energies to uh, Ascent Solar? Ascent. I had done some consulting work for the largest investor about a year and a half to two years ago. Mm -hmm. They brought a new C CEO in, Jeff Max. Jeff uh, wanted to replace the CFO at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was brought in at C the CFO uh, right before we did our, right before we did the financing. I didn't have, I didn't have a lot of impact um, because I, I was brought in too late. <laughs> but so um, we did the financing and I was CFO and then the board uh, um, board decided to make me CEO at the end of April, beginning of May. Mm. Now, I, I and, and I could be wrong about this. I, you know, I'm I'm only 33. I've been in tech mostly. Um, I don't hear of many CFOs that end up going to the CEO position. How has that uh, been for you? Usually, I think. I wouldn't say that they're at, at odds, but I, I think the best companies have a good relationship between the CEO and the CFO. We, I mean, we had a, we had a, we had a fairly good relationship that, that, um, so no, but it's more common than you think. Mm. I mean, one of the last your uh, um, what's your other line of business that you do? I just went sure. blank. Uh, 3d printing. Yes. Hmm. So I was brought in as a CEO and CFO of a 3D printing company in Atlanta. Oh, we did uh, um, guides that were used for yes. implants. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we did that. And so my non-technical background had to get into, I think it was a Stellantis, I think is what our... Mm. our 3d printer was it broke down and had nobody else there and i'm sitting here going through it with a tech on the other line but i fixed <laughs> the, i fixed the thing and it nice. came back up and we can sell it so nice. yeah so yeah that is the grind yes yeah i understand <laughs>
and I can't remember the name of the manufacturer. It started with an S. Mm. They do um, they do a lot of medical. Yes, and and that's a huge field that's uh, yeah. that's just growing more and more. Um, yeah, that's very cool. So, uh, so talk to me about um, Ascent and and what okay. you guys are doing now. All right. Well, Ascent was actually created in over 20 years ago. Mm. Um, I think we went public 13 or 14 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, when we uh, when we first went public, they were trying to capture more of kind of a retail type deal. They created a pack you know, foldable solar pack that could charge your phone and do some other stuff like that. Didn't really, it, 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 and stuff you could stick on the back of your phone. Yeah. Okay. Um, didn't go real well. Mm. Okay. Then we, then uh, we, we got involved with the agrivoltaics. They were looking at building wraps around buildings um i had i had enough experience that building wraps is too tech it's really too technical to try to get into yeah quickly um and then with the agrivoltaics that's where the german investors came in because we had a, we had a sister company tube solar mm. so we were going to provide supply product to them to put inside of glass tubes that we're going to use in agrivoltaics mm. So that was the I'm idea. Sorry, just for anyone that's not uh, aware of what agrivoltaics are, could you break that down a little bit? Sure. So this, you, you may have seen an announcement that we were, we applied for a grant and got, mm. uh, we were encouraged to, to, um, to apply for the final part of the grant. We're in the process of that, but agrivoltaics, the one that tube sold, tube solar used it was about a tube about that big maybe mm -hmm. five or six inches and then we would there would be an our um uh thin film solar would be inserted in the middle of it mm. and then it, it would blow in the breeze and do that it could take winds up to 100 plus miles an hour wow but it but what you do is you design it to go up a, anywhere from 18 to like 24 feet above the, mm -hmm. the uh, crop. Oh, wow. The reason you want it that high is, is so they can run machines under it. Oh, okay. Right. Otherwise, the ground would be, yeah, yeah. You're, you're ruining up your crop space. Yeah, that makes Correct. sense. Correct. So, um, the one we're experimenting with, um, with the DOE, Department of Energy, mm -hmm. that's going to go into a vineyard in, oh, cool. in California. And mm -hmm. so, there's like three um vines so you have a vine a row of dirt vine another row so what would happen is is these would go up probably in the middle of the rows outside of three mm. um vines and it's going to be the, the machinery and equipment on a vine is actually not quite as tall as it can be somewhere else but it'll be like 18 to 19 feet above ground okay well, what's in there's two things you get. You can produce energy that helps supply the energy to the farm or a farmhouse that's near it. Um, but you also get shading that reduces your water usage. So it really helps in arid environments also. Mm. California and being one of them. <laughs> California being one of them, precisely. It doesn't look. Our product's not going to be designed to go put in a wheat field in Kansas or, or mm -hmm. Iowa or places or corn over there. Yeah. It's not one that's more rural. So you have issues of where you connect into the uh, um, grid. Right. One, two, you potentially have issues if, if they, if they're constantly pumping water out of the ground, you can use it for that. Mm. But outside of that, it doesn't really behoove your your the power rates are too low there, so economically it, it doesn't work as well um, yeah. necessarily there. So it's going to be in like California, potentially in Arizona, hmm. potentially in some other places where the power rates are higher and the crops are smaller, asparagus, things like that. 
broccoli right. maybe yeah right well it you know it's a good point because i i think you know when people start getting into the idea of solar and alternative energy i think it's just like the recycling promise you know like you know we'd love it to be 100% but it just it, it's just not going to be there and so really like putting the alternative energies at the places where it makes sense you know seems right. to be the 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 best way to get it adopted and and everyone using it instead of just hey everyone use water or everyone hydro or everyone use solar um it just it's just not it doesn't work like that it doesn't. And yeah. there's one state that just came out with some problems. <laughs> I won't go into it. You probably know what it is. But anyway, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the net metering side of things, they're not buying the solar anymore because they have too much of it during the day. <laughs> so yeah. it depends where you are, though. A lot of the state's fine. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, I, and this this is important, though, because I think, you know, we we – we do talk about technical stuff here, but we also try to talk about the human side of things. So I'm, I'm glad that we can kind of talk about uh, more of like what just makes sense. Uh, you know, Correct. we can talk about what could be, but like what works. Um, so it's interesting. So the retail side of things didn't didn't quite pan out. And then you no. guys went um, more for like a premium thing. Is that where the space side of things came in? Yeah, we Jeff also moved us into this acquisition where we're providing watch dial solar mm -hmm. for watch dial. Yeah. Um, and so we bought a company fleece them. We bought the ad, just the assets, not the company. Let me rephrase mm -hmm. that. It was assets. Um, and it, uh, so we did that. Um, and, uh, but, I did. I wasn't sure where this. So then I took over as CEO. I wasn't sure exactly where that was going. Mm. So I repositioned the company in two areas. Basically, it's a more high margin space and uh, agrivoltaics. And when I say agrivoltaics, I'm not putting this in large farms, like I said before. Yeah. So um, where we can get a little higher margin. Mm. Then I um, we we looked at everything inside the company. I did, I'm not a micromanager. I have good people. I say, this is where I want to head. And they, mm. they did it. You know, they, they took us from 10.4 efficiency to 17.55 efficiency. Mm. Um, you know, I wasn't out there looking at machinery and equipment yeah. and saying, let's do this and that. Yeah. So um, anyway, so we, we, we got, we got that and we got, you know, we got attention of some people in solar, but one of the reasons it's also put in solar is, because of what you said in the lead in it's growing dramatically and there's some limitations. There's several limitations, including just the ability to get raw material for some of the other products that go into yeah. space. So, um, and, and, uh, anyway, so that's why I said, that's where we're moving. Um, you know, so we, we, uh, we have our only salesman really has 10 years of space experience. Okay. Um, so um, I have experience from, you know, people in the CIA, military, DOD from my background. And so we're just kind of putting it all together and that's where that's the space we're going after. Nice. Yeah. I, it, you know, it's from a space perspective, you know, I, so I was going, my, story is interesting because I went to school for aerospace engineering at kind of the very end of the space shuttle era. So 2008, um, shuttle gets retired in 2010, uh, 2011. And uh, finding a job at that time in the aerospace industry was very difficult. Um, and we, we were experiencing a drought as a country, you know, I mean, if things hadn't gone the way they did the last decade and we had to rely on the Russian Soyuz to go to space, we might not have a space program or a, or a space station right now. So we're, yep. we're, we're luckily in this place where space is booming. The U S figured out, you know, we had a lot of private partners between blue origin and SpaceX and many, many others figuring out the things that we need to do and kind of putting the risk and the financial stuff up front to, to boost us to where we need to go. Um, and then at the same time, we have this kind of change of these satellites now can be, can be smaller and built with cheaper parts, 
So you've got more people who are getting into the satellite game than ever before, um, which I think is a really unique opportunity for you guys. Um, it where is. <laughs> instead of you got instead of a company having to be like SpaceX, where they're fully vertical and they build everything for the most part, um, many companies aren't going to be able to do that. So they're going to look to people like yourself with solar technology as they're piecing together the satellite that they're going to build. Correct. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and what you're seeing about this new age of space and satellites. Uh, and well, how, how does the customers, how, how does that look for you? Okay. You kind of summed it up fairly well. <laughs> Although um, some of the bigger guys, even though they might be vertically, there's, there's a couple of bigger guys that are vertically in it vertically integrated with the exception of um solar mm -hmm. and one, one or two other areas but they're 80 80 85 percent vertically integrated right um i would just say that uh um the other two are vertically integrated but what's slowing them up is is the solar side of things yeah um so uh um, and then, so, so that's kind of where you sum up the market, but the bigger driver is the fact that they're going to, there's going to be 10 times as many satellites in orbit in seven years. Yeah. So you have growth and then you have limits to, you know, most of the solar up until about a year or so ago was gallium arsenide. That's how you, mm -hmm. you did it. It was, that, that was the product you used. Mm -hmm. Um, now some of the raw materials in that are also used in other parts of the rockets and other places like that. So there's some, there's a lot of supply chain issues. Okay. Mm. Some of them, part of it was been COVID, but part of it is there's just too much demand for some of the products and, that, yeah. and there's more usage. So that's, that's teamed up with a lot of stuff and talking to other satellite companies, one of their biggest, area or issues is um what delays or solar hmm. now having said all of that the other driving factor which is one of your questions is space debris yeah okay so let, i'll jump into that a little bit please i think it was yesterday european space uh a group basically said their goal i think it was I read it real quickly, but maybe it was 2035 or 2040, no space debris. Okay. Oof. So um, uh, the FCC laid out their first fine to a company yes. three months ago for space debris. $150,000? Yes. Hundred fifty thousand bucks, which is small compared to the uh, what I was reading the revenue that that satellite gave the company. But regardless, yeah. that's like a big changing eras. That's a big step for the FCC to do right. that um, in the first well, place. So. I, yeah, I don't know everything, but SpaceX put up satellites and had to bring them back down. I don't yeah. know how many there were. Okay, but they yep. brought them up, had to bring them back down. I, I don't know what caused the problem. Okay, we can all guess, but no, that's yeah. just a guess. So I don't know. Yep. Um, so you, so the, the a lot of the government and other entities that are going to use these satellites want them to be able to effectively dodge. Mm. or be able to maneuver dodge is a bad word maneuver out of the way of space debris yeah well if you put more solid fuel it's more heavy so it costs you more to get it up into the air you know that cost can range anywhere for low low orbit you know 15 to forty thousand dollars a kilogram yeah. If you want to go up to higher orbits, it's six digits a kilogram. You want to put it to the moon, it's six digits to seven digits a kilogram. Not so, to mention the time delay on how long it's going to take to actually get up there and I'd strap on a ride. Correct. Yeah. So you have all these issues. So ours is flexible. It's lighter. We can roll it up. We can do a lot of things to help mm. facilitate that and lower costs. So I think that's more of the potential growth growth engine that we have. 
Yeah. And so the yeah. other thing it does give you is you don't have to put as much propulsion. So it's lighter there and you can use, right. there's been a lot of advances in electric propulsion. Mm. And so the one other key factor is, is so when something, you know, so, so there's two types of debris, man-made and natural. Mm. Natural debris hits ours and, you know, you can go to our website where we have bullet holes, where we did some stuff for special forces and the seals, but you hit a bullet hole. That's really, so that, that may take out 5% of our power. So our product's still functional mm. and if something hits it. It doesn't shatter glass and it, you know, it makes it, more it debris, becomes more space debris. Yeah. So, um, but the other thing is, um, the fact that we, we, one of your other questions, we went up to the space shuttle, we were missing, and we were up there about a year. And what we found is our, our uh, product has degradation and stops degrading. Mm. So that way we, we could produce enough power to use electric propulsion in space to move it out of the debris. That's kind of a new thing that, that also could give us yeah. a lot of traction. Absolutely. I mean, and not to mention all the satellites that are still up there that uh, really don't have many other options or they're, they're defunct spy satellites that are still sitting up there. Right. Um, yeah, so, so tell me more about some of the benefits. Um, so the flexibility obviously is huge. Um, and, and, and impact after, let's, let's say it does get hit. Um, could, could you dive more into the benefits of that? I mean, that seems. Yeah. So if it gets, let's say we got hit by a piece of debris and it knocked a, an in, you know, an inch by inch hole mm. in our product. It would, it would affect it, you know, it's going to knock out, you know, three to 5% of the power production uh -huh. just in that one spot, the way we design it. It's that's the way it's designed to, to work. Whereas if you're doing more of a glass uh, covered or silicate backing, mm. it could take out more just because of the way it, the way the product is put together. Right. Yep. Yeah. Way more detrimental to the whole mission. Yes. Mm. Mm. That is, that seems really important <laughs> to have up there. It, it um, should. I mean, so what we do is we take, you, you were asking how we make it. We say, yeah. I'm going to look down and read all these chemical names. We take <laughs> Please. selenium, um, uh, indium, gallium, and uh, copper. Mm. We start with copper, then we go to selenium, then we go to indium, and then we go to gallium, and then we put it on a poly polyamide back, backing. Mm. that's what creates the flexibility in that. And that's what nobody else has d really decided to do. And uh, um, so we're lightweight and flexible because of that. That's great. You know, uh, one of the things that frustrated me as an aerospace engineer growing up in that drought era um, was we were, and, and understandably so now that I'm a little bit older and a little bit wiser, that is what you had to teach the engineers at that time because there really wasn't an option. You couldn't just go design your own spacecraft and have fun with it because that's not what the industry was doing. So flight heritage was super important. Um, so something that had already flown, but the conundrum there was, well, if we can't fly it, then how do you get flight heritage? So Correct. It, it, it's a little bit of a thing. So you guys are in this really unique opportunity where – the timing of everything you have this product that's ready to go that is ready to test and there's a lots of flights available to do so um and i'd love i'd love to know later if you guys have already sent this up there um but uh like you have this opportunity to take a new product and put it in these new satellites before anyone else in the industry has really taken a second to say hey we can do things differently um how has that been is that a challenge for selling it um, because of this flight heritage mentality? Um, or do you see a lot of people looking for new options? That's our biggest challenge. Mm. Okay. Because we're like eight and a half TRL. We're not quite to nine because <laughs> we, we were on Missy for like whatever, 12 months. You got to be on Missy for whatever. You got to yeah. be out in space for 15 or 18. I've forgotten. But anyway, so yeah. yeah. 
Um, so that's, um, that's an issue, but the bigger, but there's also a huge issue in the fact that, oh, DOD or somebody wants a satellite. Oh, we're delayed because we don't have, we don't have the, uh, uh, solar. So there's right. this big play going on. And I think because of the way, um, uh, it's changing rapidly, but I would say that's one of our bigger risks. That's one of the things. There's also some more tests you can do today, mm. and that is uh, radiation testing. Mm. And you can now test it to act like it was in space for a year, five years, or longer. Oh. So we are working with another entity to look at testing it for a longer period. The other thing is, is DOD now wants to do the low orbiting satellites and let them have them stay out there longer than five years. And really the only the, one of the bigger ways to do that is we get back to electric propulsion. Right. And that means the, sat the, the existing solar array has to keep producing for a longer period. That's again, where we have an advantage because our, um, we don't deteriorate as mm. fast not deteriorate that in the word I'm looking for the, uh, um, the degradation in yes. the panel. Right. So that was the other thing you get in here. So in the, in the past, everything had to be 17% or higher Yeah. efficiency. Why? There's only one reason because it can't be, it can't be below 10 or 11 in five years. Yeah. So, it, you know, they didn't really need 17 or 18 or 19 percent at first or a lot of applications did but it had to be there and so right. you could put up 14 or 15 percent if it only degraded to 13. ah man so yeah so there's all these little nuances that are going on and and um yeah so anyway and and you know nasa ran things differently than a business it's true. okay it's true so it's you know you know, where there's, there's, you know, two, two individuals, um, that are driving more of everything in space today than, yeah. than some of the old line folks are. And it, it's rocking some boats for sure. For yes. sure. Um, so from your experience, not having the, the, the technical, um, or not leading on the technical as much, um, What's been your challenge or successes in in dealing with technical people? Because I think, um, and this is this goes the same way for for technical people, and maybe some insight on how to have better relationships in the company or with the people they work with that aren't technical. Well, um, we have our finance side who's not technical, and then we have Paul. Okay. So, but I've run some, I've run some other companies have been in the senior levels where I've dealt with a lot of engineers. Yeah. So what I don't do is step out of bounds. I try to understand the, the situation and, and re react to the situation and listen to my, listen to the engineers. Yeah. Okay. So it also helps that I have three sons that are, that are all positions differently. You have an engineer who's my youngest son. I have a finance guy who's my middle son and then have a bio guy who's, nice. who's my oldest son. So, <laughs> you know, it all, you know, I've, I've learned from them also. Oh, that's, that's very cool. That's very cool. Um, so what else can you tell me about the company and where you guys are, are excited to, to look out or even if you're if you're trying to put the word out to other companies who are trying to think outside the box um what ascent can can provide for them well we're trying to work with companies that are going to think or think outside the box where you know so we're teaming you know we're trying to team up with companies that think outside the box mm -hmm. the testing is very expensive and so we were hoping to team up with some companies that are they're going to do the testing um, for us, that then will ultimately use the product. But it's a you know it's a you know the single biggest issue we have is what we discussed earlier about how the space is, and then you know it's 
um, small cap companies, it's a difficult capital raising environment right now. Yes. So yeah. I'm kind of, you know, threading that needle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To get us through this, you know, what hopefully is a, a, a drought period that, that ends um, yeah. for sure. Um, is there anything in the, in the space industry right now that's, uh, that's exciting you that, that could bring those, uh, those winds of change that we're, we're looking for? <laughs> I'll just say, I hope so. Okay. I can't say any more than that. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. And yeah. I mean, look, we're, we, you know, we, we've got a couple of different, um, you know, uh, we, we had that one DOE project. We're talking to somebody else about another DOE project. So there's, you know, so that's when I, you know, what, what the government has done is more retail oriented or panel oriented credits and things like that. Right. We haven't, you know, that doesn't really touch us as much, but there's a lot of dollars also pouring into technology side of things. Mm. So, um, you know, we're hoping to benefit from some of that also. Cool. Um, question for you, cause this is another, it, it relates to the satellite um, boom right now obviously astronomy uh, and, and amateur based astronomy, uh, earth based astronomy is definitely uh, it's a, it's a dicey topic. Uh, obviously with SpaceX being the one that can launch their own satellites, they're the ones that are launching the most right now and the quickest. Um, well, they're definitely not the first ones to have the idea about satellite internet. Um, they've done some work to drop down their reflectivity of their solar panels for sure. Um, while for astronomers, it's not good enough. Uh, is there any with your manufacturing process do you know if there's any type of advantage in that area that might make it um less reflective or at least not more reflective than um say the glass option hold on a second okay <laughs> i'm looking at some panels i don't we're not as reflective to answer okay. your question i okay. don't think we're as, i don't think we're as reflective okay um, it would seem, so, though, with it not being glass-based. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm going to disconnect it. That's it. Not glass. Yeah. So um, from that standpoint, I hated to bring that up, bring it to me, but I was that's what I was looking at it. I just don't think we're as reflective as other stuff, oh. although I'm not 100% sure. I can't answer that question with total. No, confidence. that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. It, it broke up a little bit there, but it, oh, it I'll did? definitely. Oh, Sorry. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, I'll I'll keep things rolling here. Um, okay. But that's that would be definitely, I think, uh, a really big. I think you could tap into the, for lack of a better word, the astronomy anger that's happening right now. That that is a legit con concern. You know, if if you know a child can't access the sky as easily as they could in the past, that's definitely something to consider with everything that's going up there. So it, it could be, if there's something there, that might be a good point to throw across there. Okay. Let me do this. Let me do a follow-up because let me yeah. ask some of my technical people and see if it's... I'd love that. Yeah. All right. I'll do a follow-up on that. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's see. I want to see if there's anything we didn't touch on here. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is just, we mentioned it, but I just want to touch on it a little bit more the the space debris problem is we didn't have the scale of things in orbit where it was really something we could really think about but any kind of impact you know the the idea of the kessler syndrome that once we start getting something going and that debris hits other debris and it just keeps rolling it feels like your thin film technology is just going to reduce that kind of scenario from happening uh was it that would. something yeah it would is that something was that something you guys were considering or or was it really just about providing something different to the to yeah the so what's interesting is you know 12 to eight, call it 12 to 18 months ago mm -hmm. you saw a growth in satellites but it really wasn't to the extent back you know that, that, that now you've learned in the last 12 to 18 months um so you have that. And then, um, so now I think that got everybody worried about debris and then yeah. people saw debris because there's some old satellites, you're right. That just broke, you know, 
yeah. something hits it, there's no way to move it. There's no way. And so yeah. most satellites are going up with the ability to move them and try to dodge debris mm. um, to an extent. If you run out of solid fuels, then you're out of solid fuels and you're in the way of debris. Right. So, um, but, uh, um, you know, uh, so that that's that's a huge risk. And you're right, the more something the more breakage you have in debris you create that's flying around at twenty thousand miles an hour, it causes problems. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um so so let's let's recap. So we've got this flexible solar technology. It's degrades less. Uh, efficiency wise over time. So you've got more power over time of your mission. Um, right. If there is some kind of impact, you're, you're isolated to the impact and the effect of the efficiency there. And it's not as panel wide as it can be with this older technology. Um, and from a, just a debris scenario, it just makes more sense. You know, you're not just <laughs> throwing stuff out there. Um, and making the the problem that much worse is is there anything else there that I missed or that we should touch on? No, that's it. And we keep improving. You know, if you look at some of our announcements, we keep improving our efficiency. We took it from, um, you know, ten point four to seventeen point five five in basically nine weeks. We're still messing with. <laughs> yeah, we're still we're still exploring with. Uh, some of our manufacturing processes um we're we're, we're adding zinc oxy um as our you know uh which will help with the degradation again and potentially help with more efficient with more efficiency at the beginning mm. so we're constantly trying to innovate and so you know i always view as one boss told you know who told me he said paul i'll let you go and i do this okay and that's basically how i manage i say this is where yeah. i want to go mm. and i go you know you know if you don't don't totally step out of bounds but i'm not going to be there and tell you how to do it and that's historically that's how kind of we ought that's how ascent operated so i had great people and i just let them go yeah and it yeah. it created what we have done in the last nine to 10 months. That's beautiful, man. I, that's, that's great to hear. I think, um, I think it's also really good to hear because the, I'd say that the more technical folks and, and I was one of them for a while until I started my own gig and, and saw the reality of, of your plan that you had in the beginning and then how things really turn out in the day to day. Um, how much of that is at the core of like, anything that we do, whether it's highly technical, trying to change the world or just helping the people around you, how much of it is really just that it's just staying in the pocket, like a good quarterback and relying on your line to keep you safe. That's basically the best way. That's a good way to phrase yeah. it. <laughs> Although I've got, you know, maybe I have 20 linemen, so I got a much bigger pocket. <laughs> so I'll let them do that, but that's yeah. a good way to phrase it. Yeah. Mm. So I've been concentrating on letting, you know, finance staff do the finance side. We have a great CFO. We have a great COO. And, and, you know, I just sit down and try to understand. I want to understand more because that affects how we market. So, Mm. I've been spending most of, you know, majority of my time either raising capital or marketing sales. Mm. Mm. So those are, those are the two areas I'm focusing in. on. Oh, what's your learning style? Like what, what do you do to help you? Cause I'm, I'm sure that's gotta be, you're, you're constantly learning. Um, are, are there certain things that you do to help it stick or to just to help on yourself understand it better? Uh, between my, uh, on the engineering side or on the sales side, I get, uh, you know, probably five or six links to go read up on stuff. So that's, that's where, that's where I'm learning the most. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Now, do you just sit down with like a cup of coffee and you just dive in or, uh, do you use note cards? I'm always interested the different ways that people like learn stuff. Are you, or do you just take it in and it's like a sponge? 
I, I would I take, you know, I, I will go through an article. I'll skim it, go through it, and try to take some highlight points. Because, like, for instance, I went through the, lar the, the larger article on, you know, what the European Space Agency did. But yeah. I didn't. Now I'm going to go through it tomorrow morning and kind of reread it and kind of yeah. understand it um, a little bit more. But uh, so if I was a sponge, I would have been able to tell you what date it was. And I couldn't remember exactly what date it was. But anyway. Yeah. So they're they're moving in that direction. So that's kind of how I learn, and I do take some notes. Yes, cool. Because cool. I learn by I learn better, or I'll remember stuff better if I write it down. I've got a notebook with me all the time, so I'm I'm with yeah. you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I learned in college. The more notes you take in class, and you study off the notes. Mm. Not necessarily the reading you did. The better off yeah. you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i i was learning that in college uh and i just remembered that the 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 days that i was in class taking a note and it was like some weird like drawing i was doing in the top right but i could remember that page i could remember the smell in the room how i felt that day something about that connection is is the paper to pen thing um it's yep. in there for sure yeah. And everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. So Paul, um, if, if folks are interested in seeing what a sense solar does and, and maybe wanting to work there, what, what kind of jobs are you guys looking for if you're looking to hire or if someone's interested in getting involved? Yeah. You asked, that was the one last thing I was going to bring up. You ask about STEM. Okay. So, um, I sat down and, and spoke with my COO real quick on the, on the question where we're going to see a need is chemical engineers. Mm. Cause when you start looking at certain chemicals and putting together and how it reacts with other chemicals in there, chemical engineering and electrical engineering, those are the two yeah. areas that um, we would need. And then, you know, some uh, people that have gone through maybe a trade school for, for running, you know, uh, equipment. Yeah. Because our equipment is, is you know, sophistic is more sophisticated and you got to do different things. It's not, you know, it's it's not, you know, something that cuts metal or something like that. So. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. That's very cool. So, uh, and where can folks go? Um, your your website to, to find out or to reach out? They can go to our website um, right now. I don't anticipate like hiring people in the next, you know, call it 30 to 90 days, but that could cool. change. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's reasonable. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll put the website here so that folks can check you out. I'm sure whether you're interested at working there or just learning more about what you guys do, I, I think they'll definitely find it interesting. Okay. Sounds cool. good. Awesome. Paul, anything else that we didn't touch on that you, that you'd like to leave the folks with? No, I cool. it was, a, it was a good interview. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it was nice talking with you. Um, so with that, We'll uh, we'll leave it up. Thank you for joining us for another episode of People of Science and uh, learning more about Ascent Solar. And uh, we wish you guys luck for getting that technology adopted because it sounds like it would be very useful for the space industry. So um, appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, folks. Spread love and spread science, and we'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space. See ya. Thanks.